Now, last but not least, in a very special way. So this is full circle. Uh, the next speaker started expand with us five years ago. We just counted, and uh, she's an amazing person, amazing friend, and a great product person. Uh, she's the senior product manager at Talabat, senior two, or I forgot the name. And uh, anyways, I would like to welcome my dear friend, Lean Ashkar. Thank you, Tambi, for Hi. the warm introduction. Hi, everyone. I'm Lean, as Tambi introduced. Uh, I am a senior product manager at Talabat, and today I'm here to talk to you about... Okay, let's skip the slide. Yes, I'm here to talk to you about how every product feature that you build has an impact on the business top line, that is revenue, and why everyone in product and tech should care about this. As many of you probably have experienced in many companies, business people and product and tech people do not speak the same language. To solve for this and to bring alignment within your organization, it's really important for everyone in product and tech to know how a business makes money. Why? First of all, it will help you communicate the impact of your work in business language and it will help you set the right metrics to measure for getting there. So when we say they don't speak the same language, what do I mean by this? As a CEO or a business leader, I care about the company's profitability. I'm thinking resources, I'm thinking resource allocation, I'm thinking how do I organize my company to make sure we're driving the largest impact to the business. So when a product and tech team proposes a set of features, they will think to themselves, why are they building this and not that? Is this really where the biggest impact lies? Are these our biggest growth levers as an organization? Now, as a product manager sitting on the other end of the table, you're having to justify why feature X and not feature Y. Why do I believe this is where you know, we're delivering the biggest value for our customers, but also the biggest value for our business? Or you could be in a situation where you've got CEOs, executives asking the product team to build a set of features that you don't believe are the biggest bets. And you're having a challenging time, having an effective and an objective conversation as to why you don't believe those are, are the right features for the org to build today. Software engineers, which are at the heart of building the product, often ask themselves, why am I building this feature, right? How does this plug into the bigger picture? What's the value in this small thing that we're introducing? We all here need to learn how the business makes money, and we need to learn how to translate the value of the products and the features that we build into business revenue figures to be able to bridge that gap in communication and build alignment within the org. So today, I'm going to walk you through the basics of finance, revenue, costs, profit. Um, we're going to talk about how you translate the value and the work you do in product to those top-line business metrics, going through metric trees, how you can go about choosing the right metric for your team, and then we'll sum up with a few key takeaways. So the building blocks of any business start with revenue. Right? That is essentially the income that comes into the, the business from the items that you sell. Costs of goods sold, COGS, also referred to as COGS, are the prime costs that go into the product that you sell. So if I manufacture cars, COGS are all the material costs that go into building a car, the metal, the rubber, the tires, I don't know what else goes into building cars. <laughs> For software businesses, this could also be a cost of service, uh, the servers, you can, uh, cost of any payment fees. That all goes in COGS. Now, revenue minus COGS is essentially what you're left with, which is gross profit. Clear? Good. Then you've got a bunch of other costs, right? So marketing, advertising, everything that goes into selling that product. Employee salaries, rent, travel, 
These are all other costs, which then, when subtracted from gross profit, you're left with earnings, which are either profit or loss, positive or negative. Who here has seen a profit and loss statement before? Amazing, cool, clear. So revenue, as you can imagine, can look completely different from one business to another. So, for example, subscription-based companies make their money through subscription fees. Spotify, Netflix, all of the SaaS software solutions are subscription-based revenue models. And then you've got marketplaces, which are a very common business model in the world of tech, where you're connecting vendors with users, and the platform, be it Amazon, Taliban, Uber, takes a cut from the transaction. You've got a lot of other types of business models as well, but this is essentially how revenue comes into the org. Now let's start off and take an example and look at a transactional-based business model. What goes into driving revenue? Revenue, the top line of that profit and loss statement. So revenue is essentially a factor of it. You're taking a commission from GMV, GMV being the total transactional value that happens on the platform. GMV is essentially orders times average order value, right? So the more orders you have, and as you grow the average order value, you can grow GMV. So for example, I'm Amazon, I have uh, 10 orders placed on the platform today. Every order is worth $30. That's a total of $300 in GMV. How can we grow orders, right? So you can grow orders by either getting more customers onto the platform or from your existing customer base, you can grow their order frequency. So you're increasing the number of orders per customer. Orders per customer is essentially closer to everything we control in product. Why? Because it's a factor of conversion from app visits. So you've got people that open the app, get on the platform. You want to try and get them to place an order during that session, which is conversion rate to order. So you can either get more people on the, on the app, or you can optimize your conversion rate to order. And what I mean by that is, if we were to look at the ordering journey on Talabat, you've got users that open the app and land on the homepage. In the world of product, we control every step of that journey, right? Because I, what I want to do as a product manager of home is try and get as many users to get into the food vendor list, start exploring, find a vendor to order, from there open the menu, from there add to basket, move to checkout, and whatnot. So every step of this journey is essentially a micro-conversion towards placing an order. And every step is something we can control, right? So you can think of the many features that we can introduce within the product that get users closer to placing an order through delivering a better user experience. When I first joined Talabar, I was a product manager for search. And the first thing that came to mind was, that's it. <laughs> All I'm working on is search. And it's only until I started getting deeper into the world of search and building features that I really understood the impact of such a small functionality for customers and the business, business's top line. So let me walk you through an example of a feature I've introduced in search. In search, we knew that users come to search not only to search for a vendor. I'm here to order, I don't know, Shawurma. Saj, or I forgot the names. <laughs> um, they also look to be inspired, and they're going to go through the results to figure out what's the best match. And that's where our hypothesis was. If we add a sort and feature functionality, we will help users refine their choices and more easily find something to order, so improving that search to menu journey, right? So my goal was to get more users from search to open up a menu, one step of the overall end-to-end -end journey. So we ran a test, an A-B test, and we saw a 2% uplift in MCVR2. So that's one step of the conversion journey. What does that mean? <laughs> right? So if I go to people outside of product and tech, we said, amazing, this feature del del delivered 
value for our customers, but also for our business. We see a 2% uplift in MCVR2. It's very hard for someone outside in product and tech business leaders to really understand what does that mean. And this is where your metric tree becomes super helpful. Because what you want to do is you want to take that micro conversion, which is all the way at the very bottom of the tree, and translate that up to numbers and revenue figures that your business leaders would understand. So saying that feature, assuming it, it drove up MCVR2 with roughly 2%, this will then drive up the end-to-end -end conversion journey. So assuming that uplift was 0.02%, what you can then do is, assuming your app visits right, stay as is, and let's say we have 100,000 visits a day, multiply that with the additional conversion that you get, that gives you uh, 2,000 additional orders per day. So speaking in on orders, people start understanding what that is. But you can also go a step further and translate orders into dollar value something that they understand and care about even more, right? So you take the orders, and you can multiply that with your average order value, and you can translate that into a daily uplift in GMV, or you can say an annualized expected uplift of GMV of $21 million, right? So this is an example, but this is essentially how you can start moving away from just saying this feature drove a 2% uplift in MCVR2 to really putting a dollar value to that. For comparison's sake, right, now you can look at another feature that we've shipped, which is where we added a top-rated tag on menu items. That drove up that step of the conversion journey, which is menu to basket, MCVR3A, 1%. You can do the same math and go and, and translate that to an estimated GMV uplift of $15 million. So now I can compare, right? As a leader, as somebody who's looking to figure out how do I structure my org, where do I invest and double down in which teams, where are our biggest opportunities? This, these are numbers that I can understand. And this is not just important for you to translate the, the results of your experiments into dollar value. You can use this exercise to also help you prioritize your bets. So if I have a backlog of features, and I know that you know, customers really want these five features, you can do some math on top of that to do a bit of an estimation of what's the expected uplift in that conversion. Translate that to GMV, and then you can this will help you put a bit of an impact metric on the features that you have planned to be able to prioritize and have conversations as to why we're shipping this and we're not shipping that. Cool. Now we're going to look into a different type of a business model. So, subscription. Netflix. I'm sure all of us here use Netflix or some form of a streaming platform. So, revenue for subscription businesses comes from subscription fees. So you grow that by either you're having more subscribers on the platform or higher average subscription fees per subscriber. To, to drive up subscribers, you either get new subscribers or you make sure that the subscribers that you have today are retained. You don't want them to churn, you don't want, them to, you don't want to lose them. New subscribers are not that hard to drive up, right? Same to what we've just covered. You've got people visiting the app, and you're, you're measuring a conversion to subscribe. Retained customers, retained subscribers, however, is where you really need to understand what is it that keeps your customers on your platform? Why do they stay on Netflix? What, what is it that they enjoy in your product for them to stay subscribed and not decide to, you know, churn next day if they try a new competitor? A simple way at looking at this for Netflix is perhaps, you know, if users are watching, average number of hours, they're engaged. That's a clear measure of I'm using your platform, I'm likely to stay using that platform. But that's not always enough, right? Why? Because what are the early indicators that tell me that this user is really enjoying Netflix? So for example, Average time to find a movie. Who struggles with deciding on what to choose and what to watch when opening those streaming apps? We all do. 
Is that perhaps maybe that's a good early indicator to say, if, I'm try if I improve that part of the experience, help users discover things to watch faster, they're more likely to stay on the platform. They're more likely to remain as retained subscribers. So you can start coming up with some assumptions of what those input metrics can be. And that's what I'm showing here with these dotted lines. It's to say you can have a million hypotheses and you need to go out there and experiment and figure out, does really improving time to start watching, helping drive up the average viewing hours per subscriber? So metric trees are made to evolve. This is not supposed to stay as is, and it's something you really need to work on building with people across your organization, including marketing and whatnot, because you can also start seeing driving new subscribers could also have to do with the marketing efforts that we're putting behind the business. So you start mapping out and you can start seeing the full picture of who's contributing and who's moving which metric within the org. Now, you might be looking at this and saying, that's a lot. <laughs> These are many metrics. Where do I start? Right? And that is the notion of the only metric that matters. This is a very good quote from the author of Lean Analytics where he says that the only metric that matters is about finding the right thing to track at the right time based on the type of business you're in and the stage you're at. You should really only focus on one key metric at any given time. Why is this important? Again, if every piece of the org and different teams are looking to drive different metrics, this causes confusion, a bit of chaos, and misalignment. It makes conversations much harder. So choosing the only metric that matters helps foster alignment within the different functions of the org, being product, marketing, commercial teams, and whatnot. What's super important here is at the right time, right? So this one metric that matters is not supposed to stay static forever. It depends on the stage of the company. So if I'm an early stage company, right, we've just launched, we really care about demand. So perhaps new subscribers is the right thing to set as a goal. Now, this is not to say that you're not looking at all other metrics. You should still be monitoring other metrics. But what is it that you care about growing? That's the one that you need to focus on. And you'll start monitoring week over week, month over month, all teams and all efforts should be put into prioritizing that and driving that metric. Now, as the company matures, you really want to make sure that you're focused on retaining the customers, right? So I want to reduce churn. I want to make sure everyone that I've acquired stays a subscriber on the platform. So perhaps that's a metric that becomes more relevant as the company matures. Now, we can always go back to and focus on new, uh, on new subscribers. So if we see a massive drop in acquisitions next quarter, shift in focus, right? So you can focus every quarter on different metrics if that's what you see is needed for the business. So assuming we're looking at retained subscribers, that's the company's goal. Product can do a lot to influence that, right? You can be shipping a lot of features that improve many of the input metrics down at the bottom of the tree. But perhaps retained subscribers is not the right metric for us to track in product, but we can look at average viewing hours per subscriber. Why? Because this is something more so in our control, right? So if I were to ship a new feature tomorrow, it's more likely that I'll be able to measure that on this much in a much easier way than measuring this on retained subscriber. It's a metric that will move faster. And you can also look at all these input metrics at the bottom as well to say perhaps, you know, there's an experiment that's purely focused on driving time to start watching. I'm easing the discovery process. I'm building better recommendations into my platform, which when we know that this metric goes up, we know the average viewing, uh, hours goes up, and then you're essentially driving retained customers. And this is essentially the notion of leading versus lagging indicators, right? So the metrics at the bottom are leading indicators for success. 
you can focus on those, set that as your net metric, run experiments to drive input metrics, but then you know that these are all eventually moving up the tree and driving revenue for the business. So revenue in this case is the long-term business impact that comes from all the work that we do. This is something that you probably can't influence and measure through experimentations. It's something that you track and measure, but not as frequently as the input metrics at the bottom of this tree that can actually be monitored on a weekly basis. So you need to think about the differentiation, but as long as it's all aligned to a certain branch within that tree, you can all be focused on driving the same impact. A few key takeaways from this talk. Metric trees can help you see the full picture. You see how the business, all the business drivers, where you plug in, where other functions of the org can also plug in. Translating product results into business metrics clarify the value of your work, help you have easier conversations with stakeholders outside of product and tech. Choosing an actionable leading indicator which la ladders up to the company's goals is very important. And last but not least, for everyone in product and tech, if you gain financial knowledge, it really helps progress your career. You're able to have conversations, you understand your teams on the other side of the table, what is it that they think about, and you can help speak the same language. If you're interested in learning more, these are two very good resources, Lean Analytics book and a playbook by Amplitude called the North Star Playbook. And I'm also happy to connect with anyone who has any questions. Thank you very much.